Hi, uh, my name is Jan Wert, uh, Dr. Jan Wert. I actually started as a carpenter and I made it uh, to become an electrical engineer. I studied in Germany and then moved to the Netherlands to get my promotion, my PhD uh, in electrical engineering. And during that time, uh, I worked a lot with uh, first signal processing, that's where I started from, but then it moved slowly towards machine learning and then deep learning. I did the whole thing for uh, Philips Research <coughs> in Eindhoven and they worked mainly with medical uh, data, let's say preterm infant data was my, mostly my topic, but any other data as well. And they learned the core of data is data and uh, if you know signal processing you can dive into machine learning and deep learning and it's a very very strong tool if you understand machine learning deep learning you can achieve so much more than with basic classic signal processing so uh, interesting times we are uh, heading up to yeah because uh, the whole industry is focusing a lot on AI right now. Yeah. Everybody's sure. talking about AI. What's happening with AI in the embedded world? Exactly, that's interesting. There's actually one point why I actually moved to Fitech, uh, because there are many companies out there that do software, right? If you do some facial recognition or whatever, you, you can find hundreds of companies doing that. But the thing is, beginning 2019, around that time, uh, the edge processing came into play. And the idea of edge processing is that you not use your cloud uh, computers to, to do the calculations. Uh, you have to separate that. We can go in detail if you want to, but let's say the finished algorithm that can now run on embedded systems. And that is actually start with 2019 to become a bit more boosted because Google and Microsoft, as they brought uh, AI accelerator chips on the market. So it was possible before and of course, but that spirited the idea that, hey, why not put our algorithms on the embedded hardware and then we can use it where the data is created and then we don't have to send a bunch of video streams, whatever, to somewhere. So uh, that was always a question of bandwidth and, and uh, also security. Yeah? If, if you send something, you can interfere it, right? So this kind of question came up at the beginning of 2019 and I thought, okay, this is interesting. I want to work at a company which produces such hardware so that I can bring in the understanding of AI and they bring in the understanding of embedded hardware and we can synergize together and say like, okay, let's work on that topic together, right? Uh, I think so far it's, it's actually great because I can also teach our customers what AI is actually all about. There's a lot of misconceptions, uh, what can be done, what can't be done. A lot of people talk about it, it's, it's inflated, etc. I'm not that person, I, I would say it's, it's not true. Uh, anyhow, but the expectancies of AI sometimes are a bit off, let's say, and, and, and I like to talk to the customers and talk, okay, this is your problem, that we can solve easily with AI, this is a bit more problematic. It's not a complete self-learning system, for example, this is always an idea coming up like, oh, I just put my camera there and it's learned by itself, for example. Not the case in, you can create a system, you can do it, but anyhow, in many cases not so. There are a lot of things I, I like to clear up, I like to give workshops and I like to enable our customers to do it themselves. So I, of course I could go to them and say, this is how you do it and I'll do it for you, but I don't know, we, we couldn't reach too many people and I want to boost, let's say, the German market uh, and the idea of AI in general. So if I can tell a customer, it's actually quite simple. You are an engineer, you understand signal processing, now I teach you a bit what to do with your signals and which steps, etc. And then, let's say, yeah, I, the whole company, everything is evaluate to the next step, to the next level, and can do it on their own. And I'll just help them on the way and say, okay, this is the guidance. And of course, we as Fitech, we hope that if they now have a new tool, a really strong and powerful tool to solve a problem they couldn't solve beforehand, they need new hardware, right? And then it's like, by the way, uh, we also do hardware, and then we can combine that and say, you know, you now have your algorithms, you actually want to have it run on your embedded system, so yeah, let's, let's work together, I can help you how to, to put it actually on the embedded hardware. So, as far as I understand, and, and you're mentioning uh, 2019, all this yeah. is very new, even though it's been possible before. Yeah, exactly. As far as I understand, this requires new SOCs with uh, AI areas on them, and this is kind of a new stuff. Exactly. But in, in the embedded world, a lot of uh, times it's like uh, a serious business and yeah. it's sometimes the chip is not the latest. Interesting that you say that. So first of all, 
just just to put that aside, you don't need dedicated AI hardware. That's also a misconception. A lot of people think that you have to have it. You only need it if you really go to the milliseconds and you have a specific problem. The uh, AI chips you can get at the moment, they're only focusing on, on video analysis and they only have CNN networks or convolutional neural networks are supported. So whenever you do anything with time uh, series analysis, for example, it's actually not, uh, not possible. So ju just to put that aside, so it's a, for a specific niche, these AI chips, and you actually don't need them. So because you can run it on G CPU and GPU alone. But it's about par power ma uh, consumption a little bit. Also. Exactly, that you can yeah. say. Because there are some chips out there, really nice. We're working now with a, a partner from Silicon Valley. They have a chip out, uh, so only has like a power sink of 700 milliwatts. Mm -hmm. Wow, with a huge output of um, performance, mm -hmm. only on the AI side, but anyhow. So for specific tasks, it's interesting to use that. But important thing is that you know that um, most problems you can solve with general embedded hardware. It's always a question how fast do you really need to solve it. The thing is, if you think about AI or if people think about AI, they see autonomous driving for example. And of course, there you need a millisecond, right? So that a kid is running on the street, you want to have it now and not, not like, oh yeah, like five or minutes, seconds later. So then you need it super, uh, super fast, like very uh, high FPS. But the thing is, let's say if you have a, a um, a door opener where you want a facial recognition, does the person belong to the company, uh, you open the door. If the person stands there for, I don't know, uh, 500 milliseconds or 700 milliseconds to wait for the results, does that actually matter? Right? And there's so many questions where the time below milliseconds doesn't matter, right? So, and then you actually, in most cases, don't need AI chips. We do have customers with like high speed analysis of, of, of text, for example. Yeah, they need those chips. But in general, you can use classic embedded hardware. The idea is on it came up because of the accelerator chips. People suddenly saw like, wait a second, oh, now I can put my AI on the embedded hardware. It was possible beforehand, but a lot of companies never made the link, right? They thought, they thought like, okay, in their minds, AI is supercomputer, super clusters, uh, and then th this wouldn't uh, resonate with an embedded hardware, right? Because the embedded is, is, is super low in performance. But, Anyhow, from beforehand, there's a lot of misconceptions there. Again, it's about training. Yes, training needs a lot of computation power, but you do that on the cloud or on your PC anyhow. But your finished model, that doesn't need any computation power, or almost none. So that is easily to transport to an embedded hardware. And the thing is, yes, for general purpose, uh, AI, I would say, like facial recognition with uh, one second or whatever time frame, easy. Classic embedded hardware is just sufficient. Uh, yeah, but so I want to say so it was possible beforehand, but now let's say it's got another boost by these AI chips. And the thing is, the interesting part is that a lot of our customers, at least we're here in Germany, they're always looking for long term sustainability. They want to say, okay, when I have something which lasts the next 10, 15 years because I want to put effort in, I want it, it should last. The problem is now these chips are quite new and you, you don't know what's happening there, right? So any other given day, a new chip could come out, which is a bit better, which, they, for example, they're working now on chips uh, supporting RNN, so recurrent neural networks. They haven't been done yet, so maybe quite interesting in a couple of years, but not, it's not possible today. And also, the companies are new. There are a lot of new chips coming on the market, really good chips, but do they survive? I don't know. Will they be bought by other companies? Can you buy this chip in a month, in a year? 10 years. Yeah, it, 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 I don't want to talk about 10 years, years right? right? Yeah, uh, but I even I talk about in a year, right? So the company we are working with at the moment, it's a, it's a yeah, it's, I don't know, startup, not anymore, but kind of startup. They have huge partners, so they make a lot of money. I think they're sustainable. But on the other hand, if, if uh, Google say, you know what, you have the TPU, we like your company, we just buy it, and then all our contracts we have them might be void. So and that is an interesting field. So it's people or customers should get used to the fact that, yeah, maybe you have an AI chip, but it will be not there in the next 10 years, right? So it's good to work on some uh, open source uh, kind of like software that's easily portable to another chip if you need. Exactly. So in, in most cases, how it's, it's done, um, you create your model, you use TensorFlow or whatever, uh, you create mo your model and then you have an SDK or an MDK, like a, a model transversion ki uh, kit or something. And that's su uh, supported mostly by the company. So you have your base model and then you convert it to that specific chip. And then you have to integrate it. So actually, you're right. Uh, um, even if your chip, let's say, would fail, it, would, wouldn't, it wouldn't make the 10 year mark, um, probably you could at some point exchange chips quite, uh, quite easily. Yeah.
That's so right. one of the established ones that everybody can rely is going to be there forever, oh, for a long time. Yeah. It's a Dutch uh, NXP, right? Yeah, exa interestingly, uh, they NXP. They are probably fine. Uh, I yeah. mean, for example, right yeah. here, you have uh, something happening with the IMX 8M. Exactly. That's going to be around for 10 years. That's 15. right. But this INX 8M doesn't have any AI accelerator. They are, I heard rumors there will be a new chip out there. Probably when you post the video, it will be already done that they have a, a new board with AI acceleration on there. So that should be fine. So with them, you should go quite uh, for the next 10 years because NXP in general is looking for long term sustainability. It so might be compatible with this one. Yes, in, in I heard it's, if, it's, if it's even a bit faster. Heard. So I'm looking really yeah. forward to that one. <laughs> But uh, exactly. So, but of course, there's also Google and Nvidia and uh, our, the the big players. Mostly, they will stay in the game because uh, there's a lot of money to be made. And uh, let's say What's smaller companies, we just have to wait. Which yeah. is the other solutions you're working with? Uh, uh, at the moment, Some examples. You know, we we're working at the moment with uh, Jeff Falcon. Um, so Jeff Falcon is one of a Silicon Valley company, smaller one, but they have a huge. Uh, um, Customers, let's say, so uh, they're going for mobile market ma mo mo mainly. And the good part about the Jeff Falcon is, is, again, super low power consumption. The problem with all the other chips is uh, um, the NVIDIA Jetson, for example, or the Google TPU or so, they have a huge power consumption, right? So they're getting really hot, you mostly need active cooling uh, or something like that. And f for many of our customers, they look like a low power, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. That's actually what, the low power uh, solution, right? So um, NVIDIA and the Google TPUs are really interesting to, to have a first check, like a proof of concept, and to see like, okay, now I have an ARM system, I just try if my algorithms work there, I make them ready for ARM, I see how good the solution works, do a, can I solve my problems? And a lot of customers then come to us and say, okay, now we need something more, let's say, not, not desktop-wise, more professional, more industrial-like, uh, and also it's a support, of course, right? So the difference between, let's say, Fitech and NVIDIA is that you can call us and say, you know what, I have a specific sensor, and I, I, I can't get it into my BSP, can you help me? So yeah, of course, we can do that. Good luck calling NVIDIA and saying, hi, hey, I'm, I don't know, Heinz Müller at Exotation, I need some help, and say, like, yeah, good luck, uh, call our support or something. So there are the differences. So many people start off with uh, something, something like NVIDIA or Google Coral or something, but they, they come to us because, again, most of them notice you don't need that super high performance, right, for your solution, right? NVIDIA is very good as a high performance, but on the other hand, as I said, a lot of power consumption. So if you want to drain that, uh, lose that power consumption, you go to a different system, right? And then you notice, like, wait a second, my solution works perfectly on, a, on an IMX8 from NXP, right? Quad core <coughs> It's a quad-core ARM Cortex A53. Do you also work with the NVIDIA solutions? Uh, I tried it. I, of course, tried it, uh, but I'm, I definitely don't work with them. So for all our customers of customer projects, I will always work with something we have. Uh, because mostly also they want to have a specific solution for a specific problem, right? So they don't need a one fits all. They need like, okay, we have that device and that has to be managed in a specific way. And we need facial recognition here and it has to have that sensor. So then, <clears throat> sorry. The NVIDIA would be too general purpose, right? So we can say, yeah, okay, of course, we, we break it down to exactly what you need and we're happy to implement TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite, uh, whatever you need, uh, all the libraries onto the BSP. And, and so far, all the customers are quite happy. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, what's the demo here? Yeah, interesting. So, so we have two demos. Um, this one is like uh, hand recognition. Uh, can you see it still? So um, it's just uh, it's very simple. It's two hand gestures, hand, hand open, close, and um, that is actually made with Microsoft Azure or Azure. I don't know actually how to any pronounce it. Any hand is good. Exactly. Yeah, any hand should be good. I think you should. Yeah, you put it. You have to put it in this uh, in the video. Camera. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. You have to. It's it's a specific like in this uh, this way or uh, hand close. Oh, only eighty percent can get better. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and and uh, hundred percent perfect. And. Uh, Open, open the hand gesture. Of course, and the, so the idea is so that we show here with Azure, you don't have to have any knowledge about AI. So you can just upload your data and like click and play and, and, and just download the device again on your device. And then for customers showing like, this is very simple. You, you can train it on, 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 on different hand gestures or whatever else. But of course, you can also do it yourself, right? Um, so uh, 
this for the like the, the people who really just start with AI, just just a glimpse of that. And then of course we have another demo where you have uh, in this case this is a very simple facial recognition. And uh, first of all, I have to go closer. I get a facial recognition, and um, if you then press a button, it it determines your um, facial embeddings. And from that, I have like. Uh, I think 10,000 pictures of, of celebrities and it, it finds out which celebrity you are based on the Euclidean distance between your face and the face of the uh, uh, celebrity. And that is completely from scratch, so we can show it's, it's also native on there. Well, on the, the first one, we, need, we use Azure and also the uh, Azure, or Azure IoT Edge uh, SDK, etc. So it's everything built in, while here it's just native uh, incorporated into the BSP. Um, and that's like the, the two ways we can show like hey we can help you building it from scratch and we also can help you just have a first startup with Azure or something right and also the, the second part is interesting you notice for example just so information for you guys you notice that the calculation of the survey phase was actually relatively sm uh, slow to be honest right what happened is that the facial recognition is very fast it takes like 0.2 seconds. Um, the creation of embeddings is also very fast. It also takes around 0.2 seconds. So in, in general, that would be taking 0.4 seconds. The thing is, we have a NumPy array. For so people who know that, right? You have a NumPy array, and it's just calculating the Euclidean distance between your face and all the embeddings we have there. So and that takes time. And interestingly, if you maybe noticed, that has nothing to do with AI. This is general programming, right? So uh, that was a bit. Uh, Fast, fastly done before the fair here but so I would now have to put my mind into it how to boost the general algorithm so the facial recognition and the embedding creations which is a uh, deep learning that is super fast even on such a uh, embedded hardware where the problem is it's just a classic scroll uh, crawling of a numpy array right and then there are also some solution how to do that better so just for you at home to, to, to know that the problem is not always AI, right? The problem is your program in general. And AI, artificial intelligence, doesn't always mean only deep, uh, deep learning, right? It means the whole thing from somewhere to get the data, transforming your data, get something with your AI model ready, but then also using that data for something. And the whole thing, that can become quite bulky, right? It depends on your problem. And then you have to see, does it still run fast enough on my embedded system, uh, embedded system? right? So, um how big is it going to be, the AI stuff? Uh, yeah, is there a way to, to, to um, do you think it's going to be revolutionary for the whole embedded world? Uh, yes, I think so. I, I don't know. Yes, yes, for sure. The thing is, especially with the, the topic of AI, I would say never things like never, <laughs> because it's, it's going very fast and it's really difficult to see which direction. A lot of people are uh, afraid to say like it's all a hype because back on the history right back in the 70s and the 80s we had already like this AI winters and people are a bit afraid like oh you, you, you're putting too much expectancy uh, into the, the, the topic again and you'll lose again but seeing what's happening right now um, I don't think this will happen I think it's, it's actually great and it will go forward very fast yes and of course it uh, revolutionizes also the the embedded uh, industry I mean, we saw that already right from the last couple of years i think actually uh, um, nvidia uh, intel started 2014 with a movie videos if i'm correct uh, correct me if i'm wrong um, so it started already a bit back but now we have a boost a lot of companies creating this ai chip so suddenly there's a complete new topic on the market and let's see where that goes and yeah in general with the topic of ai um, I think it's exponential growth, uh, also like with uh, inventions, etc., and and how, where we are going, especially because it's open source. Everybody can participate, and everybody has a bit of knowledge of, of coding, can dive into the topic. I mean, creating such a system and building such an embedded hardware is a bit more difficult than just writing a Python code, I would say, right? And so, let's say everybody can can do the Python code. So we have a huge mass of people working on AI privately and in business, and that pushes it very fastly forward and we humans are always thinking in, in, in linear terms right so ah okay the last five years that 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 happened so I can estimate what happens in the next five years but with AI I would say this is more or less an exponential thing so it's really hard to say how long what will take I, I know I have to, I remember talks with people two years back saying autonomous cars will never come and sorry uh, look into Silicon Valley autonomous uh, 
driving is, is already there, right? And that, that was in a span of, of two years. So it's really difficult to estimate anything at the moment. So, but I think anything is possible. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, priorities for society in general to yeah. like be a greener, let's say, yeah. is, it, is it good to have edge AI compared to more and more cloud AI in terms of saving uh, That's a good question. energy consumption? Or uh, that might be another way to make it a big priority because if yeah. you get a lot of small ARM chips doing a lot of smart stuff in the edge, yeah, it can yeah. really solve a lot of problems. That's, that sounds really nice. To be honest, I, I don't believe so because um, I think it will only generate more devices. I think the people will not step back from the cloud because when a lot of applications, everything goes on the internet is in the cloud. So they will uh, put their AI algorithms in the cloud, which needs a bit more uh, calculation power, especially also the training also for the embedded devices will be done in the cloud so or uh, on your desktop PC, but that will take a lot of uh, energy consumption again. But in general, we just will produce more, let's call it smart algorithms, which in general will need more power consumption. So I, I hope so. it would be interesting if, if, if that would, would take that direction. But honestly, I think we just have more solutions which you suddenly need uh, more embedded things, right? Which maybe have been done before with very low power computers and suddenly need a bit more high power computers. And that will in general create more power consumption. I, I hope I'm I'm hope I'm wrong on this point. To be honest, yeah. But but edge AI means more devices because it's going to be more demand exactly. for more stuff yes. out there, more exactly. things everywhere. Yeah. And to be honest, it's also the case with embedded things. Again, back to the to the idea of solution, right? So I have a problem. I say, um, I, I um, facial recognition and so on. So I could take a really low power and IMX6 or something to to get my solution done. But a lot of people say, no, 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 what, what, what they, oh, there's an MX8 as well. Oh, it's a bit more powerful. You know what? I will be on the safe side. It's AI, but maybe I'm not, I'm not too familiar with the topic, so I'd rather go with a, with a stronger one. I don't know. I don't know if that's happening constantly, but anyhow, that, that would be something I guess we have in mind. And then that again will push uh, the power consumption in general. So I hope that people will realize after, after a while that, you know, you, take the CPU you need for the problem and don't overpower. I think in the industry or so, people go this way because it's always about, uh, to be honest, cost and efficiency, right? So say like, okay, the, the slow one is a bit cheaper. Can I solve that with a cheaper device? Yes, I can. So we'll go this direction. But in general, also um, privately or just, yeah, solving problems in general, go for the solution which just fits and not overpower. That would be one thing to save a bit on the power consumption. Yeah. Do you have uh, two or three or four, four examples of kind of like projects that you might be excited about working with customers to implement? Yeah. And what Fitech is perfect for? Interesting. Oh, yeah, there's, uh, I think you have to, to, to uh, be careful. Um, ah, maybe this yeah, is yeah. <laughs> NDA. Yeah, there's uh, several projects, NDAs, right? to be honest. Uh, there's a bunch of them? Yes, exactly. So uh, it's interesting. So we have a range, let's say, I came out more broadly. I have a range of customers and all of them are interesting because they start from a different level. So we have <clears throat> very, let's say, small companies who have no clue about AI. I love working with them because I give workshops, I go to them and I have like, a, for example, one general purpose workshop where I display what, what is AI in general, but also going in detail, how would you program that, what's a layer, what are the parameters, etc., cetera, overfitting, well, how to solve that. So it's really from two and I notice during and also after those workshops, those people say, oh wow, this is great. Now I'm really elevated to the next level and I actually can start working on my own. This is one type of customer. I'm looking forward to work with them. The other ones are, um, okay, we know AI, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have our own maybe even department or at least a few people working on that, so I don't have to explain them AI. And then it's more about, okay, how can we transfer our uh, solution on the embedded hardware device? And that's also interesting to look, okay, the problem, okay, what, what solution do we have? How do we get it on the embedded hardware? That's also interesting to see. And what hardware do we take? And then, of course, the last one, which is like, you know, we know all, we just want to buy. And that's also nice because this is quick and easy. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, how, how easy or how hard is it for an embedded software developer, embedded hardware developer to get into this field? Uh, it's, it's difficult. Some people would say difficult. I would say medium <laughs> because they are bright people. They're smart people. They mostly know how to program, um, especially if you know how to program Python. Um, 
yes, it should be easy. I mean, it's easy for me to say because I come from a signal processing background. That was my study. So my uh, drive into AI was a bit more easy because actually 90% of your work, if you go on AI, is actually signal processing. If you, until you have your data nice and clean and then you start with the nice part, creating a model, right? And um, that is actually not, they say, too difficult. The, more the whole thing can become difficult if you have no clue about signal processing, that are what is good, like identifying a problem, identifying the solution for the problem, going that way. This is actually what you have to think about. Programming the deep learning model itself, you will find hundreds of, of tutorials. And if you're already an embedded hardware programmer, you're a smart guy, you, you'll figure it out. So that, that's not a problem. The, the, the problem is more the, the whole thing. You have a, the problem and find the solution and all steps on the way. And there are many steps which can become difficult, right? How to actually collect your data, how to clean your data, uh, get the right, how to synchronize your data. People think about that, how to synchronize it. This is a step. Okay, tip from me now from the fair. If you're thinking about AI and you have multiple sensors or like camera and maybe sound or camera or accelerometer or something before you start anything think about how you synchronize your signals if you have done that you save you a lot uh, yourself a lot of work in the long run so uh, yeah do your signal processing good and you will have fun doing the ai part how do you uh, process the signals good and that is um, oh <laughs> How do you process signal? This, this is a very uh, broad question. <laughs> it depends on, 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 on what, you, um, what the, the, the problem is, of course. But let's say, um, yeah, if, if you have a solution where you want to solve this video analysis, for example, right? So, how many frames per, sec per, per seconds do I need? Which resolution do I need? Do I need it in, in color or grayscale? Is the information in detail? Then I need a uh, higher uh, resolution. Is the detail not? Is it just like person recognition or something? That you can go really small with your your data. How about uh, not a number of values? You have to kick them out. Uh, again, synchronizing data, normalizing your data, um, all this kind of that. Multiple small steps you have to go through. Um, but the difficult parts are mostly uh, getting rid of noise and uh, synchronizing your data. That is, that are actually huge problems. And then of course, don't forget that annotation. So, for uh, supervised learning, which is most cases you, you will go to the direction of supervised learning, you need annotations. Meaning you have to tell your computer, this is a picture of an apple, this is of a banana. Banana and apple, that might be actually easy at, um, at this point, but if you go for image segmentation, for example, suddenly you actually have to do every image by itself and segment it. This will take a lot of time and effort, and you have to do it properly. The thing is, if you have a general problem, that is easy, because you probably already have a data set online, which is more or less the same you, your problem is. But as soon as you go special, let's say I work with preterm infants, right? Uh, my, my, my PhD was on, preterm infant sleep analysis. The problem is there is, there is no data set on preterm infant sleep analysis just there out there, which is annotated for sleep states. You will not find it. So you will have to get professionals in there. You have to build tools for the professionals that they annotate it. You have to get interactive variability. You have to synchronize all the annotations with your data, etc., etc. That will be the problems. So again, as you, as you see, um, per question, there will be different problems. But it's always, have to keep in mind, oh, let's say, Good to have in mind, especially for people who are in management positions, if you say like, oh wow, we want to do AI now. Give your employees a chance to do the pre-processing properly. So an AI, AI project would be 90% pre-processing your data and collecting data and annotation, etc., etc., and then 10% creating your model and uh, inf uh, get your inference model, right? So in this scale, so even after six months, or so if you're like, oh, where's my model, where's my model, and they still tell you, Oh, we are still uh, processing data, etc. Uh, don't push them too much, let's say, and don't be afraid that the, the, the next part will also take six months. No, no, the, the last part will be then much, much faster. So just be patient. Are yeah. there like, uh, what do you call them, libraries of data that's already annotated, yeah. uh, provided by companies like Google or something like that? Exactly. Actually, it's, it's mostly all open source, and thank the community actually for that. There's uh, the ImageNet, there's uh, uh, Coco dataset, there's MNIST dataset, there hundreds of datasets. Actually, if you Google open source datasets, you'll find hundreds of them for really specific problems. It's great. And to be safe, there's a people 
who dedicated their time to do that for an open source community. So I'm really grateful for that. And um, actually, interesting. What's, what's really interesting is that GitHub is working just on a project at the moment that you can upload your data, but it will be anonymized on the way up, and so you don't lose your company secrets. So. If you take from the community, I hope you also will give back something to the community um, in form of tutorials, how you did it, algorithms, maybe your data, that would be actually really great. I understand that not everybody, every company can just give the data away, but if you can give something back, that will, that will be actually awesome. Um, yeah, and be, because we have to think, AI wouldn't be possible without open source. TensorFlow is open source, uh, Kathy, whatever. All the programs, Python in general, everything is open source, so uh, you use that, you have to say, you, you, we, yeah, we built on a lot of work from private people, a lot of energy from private people, so try to give something back. Yeah. Are, are the winners in AI going to be open source or proprietary? Oh well, yeah, it's it's open source, yeah, uh, because everything be open source. Because the thing is, it's not like a big company like Google is going to own the whole AI future. No, the thing is, because how how do they earn money? For example, uh, Microsoft was very clear about that. They say, program your solution however you want to. We don't care. As long as you come to our servers and calculate your models on our servers and pay money for the calculation power, right? So that's how the companies now make money. So they rent you their servers and you pay them for their computation power. So actually, it's, it's, for them it would be really good if, 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 if it's more open source, if you can do more and more and more because the more solutions that can be solved with AI, the more computation power uh, is needed and then they can sell you that. So actually, the big companies are interested that it, that it stays open source. There are some companies, I don't want to name any names because I don't know, might have bad blood or something, but they, the classic software development companies, um, uh, which were closed source, very good, and then they start now also with AI because they started panicking a bit, noticing like, oh wait a second, uh, we're losing a bit on the, on the libraries on AI. I have no experience with that, so I don't want to say anything false, but I can imagine that they always might there might be always a step behind because everything you find which is really just up to date is always open source, right? Um, okay, of course there will be uh, Audi, BMW, Mercedes, Tesla or so which working on their autonomous driving uh, software that is of course closed source, right? But I mean in general, the libraries in general how you would do something like the, the latest facial recognition model or something that is always open source. Uh, uh, you were mentioning about an important part of uh, synchronizing the signals yeah. or the data. How do you do that in a good way? Oh, um, What's the strategy for synchronizing perfectly? Yeah. The thing is there is, a simple way to do that? Or no, not, uh, not simple, but never. <laughs> standard way to do that? And also, unfortunately, I, I wouldn't say so. The thing is, of course, you, people always say clock, right? Uh, so you would have every signal which you produce should have, uh, should have an internal clock. But the idea is to, to get your mind into your problem beforehand and think beforehand, how will I synchronize my data? Because if you once rec uh, recorded your data, uh, then it becomes really difficult to synchronize. So either you make sure that your clocks are actually synchronized beforehand, say like, okay, perfect, I'm sure that my clocks on all signals are synchronized to each other, then it's fine, you just have a timestamp, wonderful. If that is not the case, I can give you an example from the, the preterm infant case, uh, and you can understand it better. So, we had video uh, analysis, but we also had ECG and uh, EOG and a lot of signals, and we had to synchronize them. And they thought like, oh, we are super clever. We, we just plug, um, because the question was like, how to synchronize the video with the rest, which the rest could be getting into one box or something and then be recorded simultaneously, but the video would be separate, for example. And then, okay, how to, to, to connect the video to the, the data. And they said, okay, we just deep plug uh, uh, a plug and put it back in, and then we have a noise peak. And then we just find the noise peak in all our signals, because they were also a bit time shifted in the, in the box, and then we can synchronize. Very nice idea. The problem was, the signals themselves are so noisy, it was very, very difficult to find the artificial noise peak, for example. And these are the things to think about, okay? How do I create something where I can identify that that is the same time point in my signal. And I, the problem is, again, this is not one fits all solution because there might be, maybe your problem is very simple and you don't have to do it. Maybe, maybe you only need a video stream of your screws and you want to determine if the screw is good or not. You don't need to synchronize anything. You only have to synchronize annotation to your data, but that you can do as a tool, right? You create a tool where you annotate 
that should not be a problem. But as soon as you have multiple sensors, then the problem uh, arises, and then you have to you have to think about how to synchronize before you actually start recording. All right, to do some test runs, try runs. I mean, I come from the medical part where it's very difficult to just set up a new trial to just create new data. It's just impossible. So you have to think a lot beforehand. But say that saves you a lot later. And also, with with parts where you just can create more data, it's always good to have your solutions beforehand and then start uh, recording. Because also in the nature of the humans, we don't like to go back. So if I want to create my data, I'm, I'm already starting with, with, with creating my deep learning stuff. And then I notice, oh, oh, my data's not synchronized. Then I don't, I don't like to go back. Because I, in my mind, I just made a check mark on the, yeah, I did my data, fine, fine, fine. I can now start with the, hey, I, I already told my boss I'm doing the model now. I'll, I'll give you an update in a month or something. And then you have to go back to your data synchronization, and then the month you say, boss, I'm sorry, I'm back in data synchronization. That's never good, right? So start in, in the front, start with thinking about your problem, think about the solution before and take your time. They want to say, take your time with that. Tell your boss, it will take time. It will take the most time, and don't worry, the AI part or the deep learning part later will be a bit faster. And, and yeah, um, stand your ground on that. And that, that should be that will, should be the solution that you take your time to think about the problems uh, properly. Yeah. So without uh, trying to get any secrets or NDAs or anything, yeah. but let's say uh, Fitech was developing a solution with a customer that has to do with a uh, uh, sleep tracking or something like that. With yeah. that, what would be the perfect implementation? What's a great idea to use AI and sleep tracking or something like this? Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be that would be great actually. <laughs> you know, this yeah. is my favorite topic, right? Uh, treatment and sleep. That would be great. It's very difficult, unfortunately, to, to actually solve that problem. Uh, please continue to work on that. Um, yeah, but anything I would say, anything uh, which should be separated from your your cloud. Let's say you don't you don't want to uh, have a device which you always have to plug in and have an Ethernet connection for something. And you don't have the means to to send a data stream via Wi-Fi or something, right? That is always the idea for edge processing. And also, of course, security, right? Whatever you send can be intercepted. If you only do it on the edge, somebody has to go to your device and exchange an SD card or something or hamper with your device itself. So as long as you don't send anything, then you're fine, right? If you if you think if you're afraid of losing your uh, company's data secret or something like that, do it on the edge. It's really difficult to intercept here. So. Handheld devices, everything which is uh, um, yeah, running on batteries, for example, uh, that would be, of course, edge solution. Everything which is a, a, a difficult location, right? Uh, a deep down tunnel, underground mining, for example. Uh, how, how would you send data to anywhere, right? So then it would be maybe a solution of, of, of um, a kind of fog, edge fog solution, where you have like a, a mainframe somewhere in the, in the underground in the mine, and you send some data to the mainframe. That would be possible. But it's even better if you just have the device on your on your, on your uh, operational devices, uh, your edge device on the operational device, and you say, oh, you're mining here. Uh, we want to identify what you're mining, and well, I found just coal. Just give a signal to the operator, we found coal, perfect. You don't need any cloud, you don't need anything to send to where it's like, where, there where you need it, you get the information. So uh, per perhaps it could be like a sensor on the bed, that's uh, IMX 8M, yeah. and that can sense there's two different people sleeping in a bed, maybe, and identifying who's who, yeah. and also how long you sleep. It, it's really important yeah. to sleep to, to recover. Like, yes. there's a few talks here at this conference about the coronavirus. I heard that oh, if yeah. people sleep good, it's the best protection for any kind of flu or whatever. It is actually. It's just sleeping because the body is uh, yeah. repairing itself at yeah. night. Yeah, 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 so yeah. If, you can, if you can do that on the edge, and then only talk with the cloud with what's relevant. Yeah, exactly. You, you could maybe develop something there. The thing is, that, that would be actually, it's quite interesting. Sleep in general, right. Your immune system is actually regenerating during good night's sleep. So if you don't sleep, actually your immune system will be overloaded and then you're really prone to diseases. Right, so sleep tight, <laughs> sleep good. Um, but this is actually a good point. Recording, for example, somebody in the, in the bedroom. Nobody wants to have a video stream of themselves in the bedroom somewhere at Amazon or, or Microsoft or so. So that is also edge a solution, right? So yes, maybe to your private cloud you can send information, you have that in a sleep pattern, but no video stream is sent anywhere. So you can do your video streaming on premise, just analyze the people, no videos going anywhere because only the solutions may be sent to a server side. And also, especially in, in Germany with our ruling here, DSG for awards and so on, then uh, yeah, it's interesting to, to not create people and to not recognize, well, let's say, to, to, to not identify people, right? So that, that to separate that. 
from each other. And yeah, about uh, the sleeping pattern, that would be generally interesting to, to see, uh, right, sleeping patterns of people. And also, also, I mean, I'm always dreaming of the robot at home, right, who's combination of several AI, identifying if I'm, if I, uh, I'm sick, seeing what's in the fridge and not, and, and going to the shop and buying stuff for me. That, that I'm looking really forward to. Please, please continue working on that. But also there, um, like this is far, maybe not that far out, but no, it should be far out, right? 2021. Bro, yes, exactly, right, 2021, that should be, should be done. And this, but the idea is also here, I actually would like that my, the robot would have all the information and send that to Microsoft or Google, the robot company owner, right? And then I was like, you know, they know everything about, they do already, but they, now they know video stream, whatever, they're all about me. So that could be actually hampering also for robot industry uh, selling, uh, hampering selling point, right? If you say, actually, I don't want to have a robot in my bedroom and saying all the information to everywhere. So if you then go add to tell, no, 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 nothing is said anywhere because only maybe the models are updated if, if the robot is once in the shop or something, right? So actually no data is sent anywhere. Just the robot has the, the model in itself. It operates on itself. It can have a solution, it, 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 it gets a solution and, and uh, operates on that solution, but no data is leaving the robot. That would be actually, I think that's a key point for that uh, direction robots in our homes. Because I know, at least in Germany, a lot of people are kind of afraid, of, I don't find the right word, but Alexa, right? I know a lot of people don't like Alexa. They maybe bought it first, but then they know, so like, wait a second, it's listening really on anything I think here, and, and, and they get rid of it, right? So, so that is happening, and the acceptance, at least in Europe, I know Asia is a bit different, but the acceptance of a robot here in Europe is really dependent on where is my data sent, where is my data stored. So if, yeah, do, they know it already probably, who is working on that, you know already, but it's a solution, it's a solution for an, an autonomous robot in your home. But yeah, so that might be also the future actually for embedded systems to say, everybody now don't have a car, everybody has a robot, so we'll have a lot of um, embedded hardware now to sell. The robot could be like uh, uh, helping people uh, live a more healthier lifestyle and anything, advising yeah. on sleep, advising on food, advising on noise, uh, any kind of thing that, yes. and just saying, hey, now it's a good time to work, now it's a good time to relax. Exactly. And exactly. just be on the side there, like a lovely, coach. Yeah. Hey, uh, taking over my programming because I can do it better probably <laughs> at some point. No, but you're right, exactly. So, you can, anything you can imagine now with a small app, for example, right? Yeah, my, my food intake, how many calories did I eat today because I want to get uh, slimmer and fitter for something like that. Yeah, a robot can easily uh, I mean, can take over that because uh, what, what would be a robot? A robot would be, let's say, a computer system with a vision system which can walk and has hands, maybe can, can touch things, right? So. It's not that difficult, not that much different from a smartphone. Yeah, it looks like different, but actually computation, etc., is more or less the same. It would be apps probably running in the robot saying, the health app, okay, I'll look at you, I identify you and tell you, hey, you look sick, right? Or uh, something like that. I think that the problem only there would be like uh, touching things and etc. That, that might be like the mecha mechanical problems more, but I think they're working, Boston Consulting, uh, not Consulting, uh, Boston Dynamics <laughs> is working on that. So I think actually we will see something like that rather soon, rather sooner than later, so. 